Okay, folks, um, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, first uh, plenary keynote speech. It's from uh, my friend Ian Foster, and um, we have worked together, unfortunately, for 34 years since, since he joined Argonne National Lab as a, as a postdoc, and then, of course, he moved on to father, many distinguished positions at Argonne and the University of Chicago. He received his undergraduate degree in um, New Zealand at Canterbury, his um, PhD in Imperial College, London. My uh, PhD advisor was actually at Imperial College. And um, though I was at Cambridge at the time, uh, um, it's uh, my university. And uh, we worked together as in the Center for Research in Parallel Computation, headed by Ken Kennedy. And Ian received the Ken Kennedy Award in 2022, the Internet um, uh, Internet uh, Award in uh, IEEE Internet Award in 2023, and uh, he has an incredible H index of 139, which we can all be uh, jealous of. And he is well known for his work on uh, systems and uh, applications for science and he's i think he says that's what he's going to tell us about it fits his title at least and um before you forget there is a reception for the for all uh, for all the people here at 6 30 in the crystal ballroom which is just two floors up from here so now i'd like to give you ian foster thank you thanks jeffrey Hey, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I don't know how do I the slides advance ma magically. Probably, um, we'll find out. Okay, so uh, a great pleasure to be here. Thanks everyone for coming to Chicago. Um, it's particularly nice to be speaking. Uh, well, first of all, to be introduced by Jeffrey, who, as he says, I've known since I was about this tall. Uh, but also uh, to be here right after Carl Chang received his very uh, well-deserved award. Um, so welcome to Chicago, first of all. Uh, you may not know, there were two, two historically unique things happened yesterday in Chicago. One was uh, the first NASCAR race run on surface streets, apparently, that's a, a thing. And secondly, nine inches of rain falling uh, in 24 hours, uh, which resulted in the Chicago River flowing in the right direction, unusually, into the lake rather than backwards. So that's... A, sort of a special thing. Anyway, enough about that. So I want to talk today about, uh, it's a topic of great interest to me, is how, how do we uh, accelerate uh, or, or simplify the work of people working on complex problems um, by uh, providing uh, services that can, uh, you know, take over responsibility for uh, time-consuming and difficult uh, aspects of their work. So. Uh, science services, we might say. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, this is, uh, oh, there it is, good. So this is actually a slide I put together uh, in 2005, uh, hard to imagine. But uh, back then I was interested in the same thing, uh, in a sense. Uh, you know, I observed that if we looked around science projects, we saw lots of people building uh, siloed, uh, that's a grain silo there, siloed applications in which they re-implemented every part of their uh, logic uh, distinct from what anyone else was doing. And then next slide. Um, I was very proud of this little animation here when I did it, uh, created it. Uh, what we would like to do, of course, is to uh, separate concerns so that the application logic can be layered on top of unique uh, well, general purpose uh, services for different purposes. And if you can click through maybe three times more, uh, we might see uh, some of the comments here. So, you know, can we, uh, oops, oh yeah, that's all right. So, you know, can we, can we uh, de then decompose our applications into services that sit in different parts of a, a network um, and, and then uh, decouple these services from the resources in which they sit and, and then build uh, applications by dynamically integrating uh, pieces uh, from wherever they may be located. So this slide was put together before we had cloud, really. Uh, we were building grid service providers back then uh, and attempting to provide the capabilities of cloud, but not necessarily doing that well because we weren't uh, billion-dollar companies. Uh, but it 
did suggest a, a way to building uh, applications that I think has proved to be a very effective uh, going forward. The separation of concerns between the services that support applications and the resources on which they sit. Okay, so let's move on and, and talk about some of the applications that are going to motivate uh, the work I'm presenting here. So I'll, I think I've got three or four examples of, of things that we're trying to do at the moment. Um, or in some sense are doing, but want to do better. So uh, one thing that uh, we at Argonne and with colleagues at Oak Ridge and Livermore are, are engaged in is building out uh, a next generation version of the Earth System Grid Federation, which is a uh, system that uh, allows people around the world to share uh, and access very large quantities of climate simulation data, uh, data present developed by the Climate Model Intercomparison Project, which I think is up to 100 models at, at this point. Yeah, it says, it says 120 on, oh yeah, more than 100 slides, I think 100 models, um, each of which is engaged in simulating the, the future of the climate system. And one wants to be able to very quickly uh, compare the simulation results from different models. Um, so a global scale integrated resource uh, and science problem. Next slide. Uh, a second example, um, this one is from uh, work of a colleague of mine. Oh, I've got a clicker. Wow. Okay. Can I go backwards? Let's see. I can. Wow. Feel, I feel more confident now in my ability to, to proceed. So this is, this is work by a colleague of mine at Argon, Arvind Ramanathan, and, and some, some other colleagues. Um, so they are interested in, in another global challenge, uh, perhaps not as severe as climate change, but of more immediate concern to, to many, which is um, predicting uh, ahead of time that their goal is uh, likely uh, variants of, uh, of uh, pathogens that may emerge uh, and cause future pandemics. Uh, and it's a very, we could spend a lot of time talking about it because it's a fascinating problem, but we don't have time for that. But the idea is to use large language models to uh, uh, predict uh, the likely or uh, well, possible evolution of, uh, of pathogens like uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, uh, and, and then uh, combine that with information coming in from, uh, from field observatories uh, to uh, get ahead of these uh, pathog pathogen variants before, before they emerge. Um, a third example, I got this, yes, got it working. Right. More uh, close to home uh, is something that I, I've been involved in with people at Argon and at, at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, um, building smart instruments for things like actually materials design and also uh, crystallogra crystallography for pandemic surveillance as well. So here you, you know, the interest is you've got an instrument that can collect vast amounts of data. You can analyze it at the edge, uh, right next to the actual data collection point. Um, and as I see here, it takes about 20 minutes. Or you can couple it uh, over the network with uh, a remote computing system where you train neural networks that you then redeploy at the edge. And you can get massive speed ups by thus linking resources from across uh, networks. Um, to, uh, to uh, then deploy intelligence right next to where the data is, is, is coming. I'll probably skip the next, uh, well, just mention this is a new project uh, just started, funded by the Department of Energy uh, to look at uh, urban uh, modeling and surveillance, very given our weather over the last, uh, last 24 hours. So these are four examples of uh, applications where people are trying to undertake global scale science. Um, the, the teams involved may span a few institutions, dozens, hundreds of institutions. Um, in principle, we should be able to build these applications as collections of services that uh, and applications and data and computing resources that uh, just link together and do, uh, allow us to answer the questions that we want to ask. But in practice, of course, they encounter vast amounts of friction. Um, so data friction is a term uh, that has been uh, coined 
um, by uh, maybe by Paul Edwards in, in his very interesting book on meteorological uh, science. But uh, you know, it's, friction is a more common and universal phenomenon uh, in, in computing. Uh, the barriers to doing things that uh, prevent us from moving forward at the speed that we would like. And of course, we, th there's a vast community of people working very hard to reduce friction. Uh, and hopefully they are doing that at a, at least a linear, maybe even a, an exponential rate. But the complexity of the systems we're working with is increasing at least linearly and maybe exponentially. And so it's not clear that we actually are catching up on, on these frictional uh, concerns. So, so what can we do about these uh, sources of friction? So one thing that's worth mentioning is that telecommunications is no longer a major source of problems in many uh, settings, not all, but many. So certainly in the US, global sci national science networks, to a large extent, global science networks, allow us to connect to anywhere at uh, often over-provisioned over uh, speeds. Um, even outside the narrow world of science, we see these uh, wonderful telecommunication networks uh, appearing based on certainly optical fibers, but also 5G, soon 6G, uh, even uh, wonderful technologies like free space optics, which uh, I depict uh, here in a picture representing, uh, I think, a more still somewhat uh, you know, forward-looking vision of, of uh, technologies that are being developed um, by uh, some, some US and, and international companies based on uh, low earth or low microsatellites, uh, free space optics and other things, which seem likely to provide uh, high bandwidth to basically anywhere on, on the planet. Um, we might, uh, in fact, and say that, uh, you know, we live in this world now where we can communicate to anything, anywhere, anywhere, so anything, anywhere. Um, we still have to deal with the speed of light, so latency remains a concern. But a, a bit like uh, Minskowski uh, talking about, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity, maybe uh, to a significant extent, um, you know, space and time become uh, more interchangeable than they than they than they used to be. But so what is it? So we can communicate to anything anywhere. What are the obstacles that remain? So now I'm going to drill down onto some rather more mundane issues, but describe how. You know, collectively, we're making good progress on some important uh, points. So here are three uh, very mundane issues that still represent important sources of friction. So first of all, uh, our ability to act on resources regardless of location. So if I'm building a global climate analysis system or a pandemic detection system, I need to be able to reach out and touch computers, storage systems, uh, instruments, regardless of where they are, um, uh, you know, we're just by thinking about it, um, shouldn't talk, just about, you know, some people can do amazing things just by thinking, like declassify a document. So here I'm talking about uh, doing things, uh, equivalent things, reaching out and touching computers by thinking about them. Um, and of course, in practice, that's very difficult for reasons that we know. Secondly, I want to be able to execute these remote actions, whether it's accessing a climate data set or manipulating a, a remote instrument uh, with, without any, uh, you know, reliably to ensure that it happens uh, without, without any concerns. And thirdly, I need to be able to manage who's allowed to do these things uh, without any, uh, you know, in a very controlled manner. I've got to be able to say, well, this person is trusted to do this action on this resource, um, but not trusted to do that action on the same resource. And, and this person here is not allowed, not trusted to do either of these things and so forth. And we'd like these uh, decisions to be, or these policies to be expressible, implementable, enforceable, and uh, analyzable uh, in ways that uh, that's typically not, uh, are not, is not the case today. So now I'm going to go through and look at how we've, uh, how we've, the progress we've made in realizing each of these things. So first of all, acting anywhere. So accessing a computer, accessing uh, a storage system. Um, well, we can do that if, if, we're, if the computers and storage systems that we're concerned about are on a public cloud and we have an appropriate account with them. But of course, many of the systems that we want to act with, act on, are not uh, so located. 
Um, so what do we do? Well, people have been working on this for a long time. People have built things like Gopher. Does anyone remember that? FTP, web servers, uh, distributed file systems, SSH, root protocols. Uh, we've also developed things like Java virtual machine containers, and each of these represents a step in the right direction, but are not a universal, universal solution. Um, so something we've been doing, uh, this is the Globus team at the University of Chicago and Argon and, and elsewhere, is uh, building out some very simple technologies but to, that turn out to work very well uh, based on local agents that we now, we actually are now deployed at tens of thousands of sites around the world that will allow you to access storage anywhere via a simple protocol, access computers via a simple uh, protocol, uh, these things we call Globus Connect, Globus Compute. Um, any system that they sit on top of with their modular layered architecture can then be turned into something that authorized people are able to, are able to access for the, from, for the purposes of data access or computing. Uh, we're engaged in building similar agents for accessing scientific instruments, but that's uh, a topic for, for another day. Okay, so that's, we'll come back to that in a minute, but let's move on. A second thing we need to be able to do is uh, achieve reliable execution of sets of actions. Uh, so if I can access this computer over here and this storage system over there, and I now want to um, move uh, data from one computer to another storage system and then from there to another computer, uh, we end up with what people might call a workflow or a pipeline. Um, and of course, people have built hundreds of tools of different sorts for uh, implementing such workflows or, or pipelines. Um, in practice, there are all sorts of complexities inherent in building such things because of the fact that failure in a distributed system can occur anywhere at any time. Um, and again, people have built sort of interesting, many interesting solutions for dealing with uh, failure in distributed systems. The one that I find the most interesting, although sort of mundane in a way, is uh, merged fairly recently, and this, this is highly reliable, uh, available cloud services that uh, can be used to host distributed state uh, spread across uh, multiple availability zones. And so this is indeed what we've uh, been using uh, in our systems, cloud-hosted, replicated uh, state uh, and supervision of distributed activities. Uh, so you end up with an interesting hybrid of cloud for your state and remote locations for your uh, the actual actions that you want to uh, you want to occur. And as we'll describe in a minute, it's also integrated with secure delegation, so you can manage permissions uh, in the in these settings. So hosted research supervision services sit on cloud. We use Amazon, but any other suitably uh, reliable distributed cloud system would work. Um, and this allows you to ensure reliability of even complex uh, distributed uh, activities using fairly simple mechanisms like automatic retry, rollback, uh, etc. So then the third thing we need to be able to do is to control who can perform what actions, when and where. And again, this is sounds maybe easy in principle, but like all the things we're talking about here is complicated in practice. Um, you know, the people have used all sorts of approaches, passwords, uh, uh, X509 credentials, um, the so-called grid security infrastructure was quite widely used for a while. Uh, people have attempted to enforce, uh, you know, single sign-on to all uh, resources. Um, OAuth has actually turned out to be very effective. Um, uh, then we have uh, mechanisms like delegation, which has been a problem that has been addressed for a, actually, the early work on delegation goes back to the 1970s. Uh, delegation, of course, being the the problem or the task of allowing me to assign to a program, uh, typically in computing uh, environments, the authority to work on act on my behalf in some in some computational setting, and 
when I say the authority to act on my behalf, that authority might include the authority to do some things, but not other things. It might include the authority to further delegate that right down to someone else, uh, but only to uh, certain classes of someone else and so forth. So you can have some quite fine-grained sets of concerns that arise when, if you want to in implement um, these delegation protocols uh, well. So um, what we've uh, developed here is um, uh, it's basically a set of delegation protocols, some of them well-known, some of them, uh, I think, uh, innovative, that integrate with OAuth, uh, the widely used, uh, that widely used infrastructure, um, to support uh, secure delegation of, of rights uh, in a distributed computing system. So I, I for example, can uh, start a, uh, a federated uh, learning application running across multiple sites and then delegate to each of those uh, the federated learners the uh, right to perhaps communicate, to access local data that I have access to, uh, to uh, share results with others, uh, but perhaps not to do things like publish the results uh, to, uh, to anywhere except a very specific uh, location. And I do have a little animation here to explain how distributed, federated uh, distributed auth auth authorization of delegation works. Let's see if it makes sense. So here's a Here's a, a, a person who wants to run a application that uses um, uh, actually a single computer in this case, node A, but there could be many others. Um, so they start off creating a thing called a flow, that's a, a workflow, a pipeline, whatever you call it. They, so they give it a consent saying this flow is allowed to act on my behalf. Um, the uh, flow can then uh, register the, the appropriate token in, encoding the fact that it's allowed to access a certain service. Uh, things then proceed. There's further messaging, verifying that tokens are adequate for a particular purpose. Uh, and eventually, uh, this function of mine is able to run on, I think there's one more click there, on a dedicated certain node with verification occurring right back to the uh, the flow service that this is indeed something that's allowed allowed to happen. So we can do this, you know, on the scale of hundreds of resources, and it seems to work reasonably efficiently. Okay, so in total, um, I've talked to you about three services that, uh, or three sets of services that um, can allow us to uh, address key friction points in achieving global scale science. And these friction points are very simple things, but if you run into them, very uh, frustrating. Um, acting anywhere, in fact, in this case, on any resource that has got one of these, uh, in our case, Globus Connect, uh, Globus Compute servers deployed. Um, secondly, uh, being able to uh, coordinate many actions in a reliable manner, and this is done by using cloud services that supervise the execution of actions on different of these trusted endpoints. And, and third, uh, we're managing who is able to act on resources when and for what purpose by using these distributed uh, delegation uh, of, of authorization uh, protocols. So those three things together allow us to now run some wonderful applications across any resource that uh, where appropriate infrastructure is, is deployed. And what are those resources? So let's look at, uh, well, first of all, a little uh, slide on, on scale. Um, so it, I mean, these, me these mechanisms could be used in many ways, but we're using them in the context of this Globus platform. Um, this is, as we say here, uh, 400,000 registered users, um, 54,000 endpoints, not 54,000 unique institutions because some run hundreds, but certainly thousands of institutions. Um, 
1,600 connected institutions, many others that are just running uh, you know, local um, uh, endpoints. Uh, I guess that's, yeah, in 80 countries, um, including New Zealand, by the way. I forgot to mention this at the very beginning. The person who won the NASCAR yesterday was from New Zealand. There we go. Okay. We were, people started texting me as, as the race was ending. Um, anyway, so this is uh, the, uh, the scale of the platform that we're running on. Um, this is what it looks like at individual institutions. So this is Argonne National Labs, uh, where we have big national uh, computing and science infrastructure. This is the advanced photon source here, which has got endpoints at every uh, beam line. The Argonne Leadership Computing Facility is in there, which is, runs endpoints so that people around the world can uh, access um, computing and, and storage on their, on their systems. Um, let, me, let me show you, uh, I had fun making the following video. Uh, so see if I can make this work with this clicker. Oh yeah, so, so this is a, a, a video of each, each large transfer performed by Globus since 2010 uh, with great circle distance between source and destination, destination at the bottom and then size on the y-axis. And you'll see uh, more and more, of course, transfers. Colors show speed. They get faster over the years. We're up to about 2019 at this point. Um, and you'll see a few, some interesting gaps here. Very few transfers at around about 4,500 kilometers because no, the oceans get in the way. So there aren't sites around the world that are 4,500 kilometers apart, apparently. Very few anyway. Um, you can see, uh, if, I've only just labeled a few of the big ones. See, there's a, a particularly large transfer from Daejeon in, North, in South Korea to, uh, to NCAR the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And the very furthest, longest transfer is between Wellington and Madrid. I found this interesting. Wellington, New Zealand, and Madrid, Spain. So actually, this reminded me of a, as a child, uh, you grow up in New Zealand thinking, knowing that you're at the antipodes of Great Britain, which is the original colonial power. Um, but actually, the antipodes of New Zealand are, are in Spain. So if you project... Uh, Wellington to the other side of the world, you'll see that uh, Wellington and Madrid are almost exactly opposite each other. Um, so we have a, a, a Globus team member in Wellington and he's going to move up the coast a bit so he can do a transfer that's exactly 24,000 kilometers, uh, which is the basic circumference of, of the world. Okay, um, so the point of that was to, the point of that animation um, was really just to convey the sense that if you deploy, if you create these appropriate local agents, make them simple enough and easy enough to deploy and integrate with an appropriate security infrastructure, you can then get people on a global scale uh, depending on these services. So they're not services perhaps in the sense that we would normally talk about services in this conference, but they are services that allow people to do things which in this case is transfer data, or it could be perform computations, uh, uh, or it could be other things as well. And on top of that, we can build much more powerful uh, applications. So what could we build? Uh, well, here's just a, this is not uh, too exciting, but it's, that we, first of all, you can do things at a scale that we might not have thought about before. So our climate, uh, modeling friends uh, recently transferred seven petabytes of data from one, one lab to two other labs just because we have the service infrastructure and the underlying network and we have facilities like the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility and others that run large storage systems, systems it becomes straightforward to replicate petabytes of data across at least a, at a national scale we could certainly do that at an international scale as well. Um, and uh, they can do that furthermore with you know, complete reliability. Um, not because there aren't failures along the, way, along the way, there are many, but they all get recovered from. So we can depend on reliability uh, at a level that perhaps we 
we're not able to do previously. We could do it for email mostly, but not for large data movements, but now we can do it for that as well. Um, so that was data movement. We also have uh, now, thanks to work by Kyle Chard and others, um, uh, a service previously known as FunkX, but now called, uh, more commonly called Globus Compute, allows us to uh, do exactly the same thing for computation. So some of you might find this an interesting uh, tool to work with. So a Globus Connect endpoint makes it easy to turn any storage system into a place to which data can be sent and received uh, under programmatic control. A Globus Compute uh, FunkX endpoint allows you to turn any computer into a system on which computation can be performed. So you deploy it with a few lines of Python. Uh, you register a function uh, with a few more, and then you can uh, run computations um, on any deployed endpoint to which you have uh, uh, author authorized access. Um, and some of the things that people are doing with uh, these Globus compute systems include things like the following. So federated learning. So this is a, a team led by a fellow called Ravi Maduri um, is uh, building a federated learning system for biomedical uh, purposes. So there are endpoints around the world, at least I think I see some there in Norway and the US where uh, people have publishing scientific uh, biomedical data, data that they want, they will allow people to compute on, but not to share with others. So you perform privacy preserving federated learning across different endpoints, uh, choosing the endpoints using a dashboard, deploying your federated learning functions, and then just collecting the results, the, the trained weights, not the actual, not the actual data. And here's a, another example. Uh, this is work by a fellow called Zhu Zhao Li uh, in, uh, in China, uh, uh, distributing very large computations across many different sites, uh, in this case, different supercomputers. And so far, he's been mostly exploring the effectiveness of different scheduling policies, but the goal is to allow for a very rapid analysis of uh, drug screening uh, data uh, rap more, far, more rapid than could be achieved at any one site. Okay. Oh, and um, I should mention, uh, so I've, I've mentioned that we can host in our, in these reliable cloud services, we can host uh, a variety of different functions. We can say, here's a set of data transfers that I want to perform ensure they occur reliably. Here's a set of computations that I want to perform. And then also uh, we can host uh, uh, multi-activity uh, flows that may link together many of these different activities. So for example, collect data from a scientific instrument, transfer it to a supercomputer center like the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, then perform analysis there, publish the results into a catalog, notify me when the, the uh, publication is completed. And the state of this uh, multi-stage flow is all maintained in cloud, persistent replicated cloud storage. And so is well, we have a high probability of it being, being reliable. Uh, so this is how, for example, we implement these flows that take data from the Slack accelerator move the data to Argon for, for training of a model, deploy the model back to, to Slack, uh, and then perform very rapid analysis of subsequent data from that, from that instrument. Okay, so, so one, one thing, one interesting thing, uh, which perhaps isn't, well, it's interesting to us who work with uh, high performance computing centers, we're starting to get very different sorts of uh, workloads appearing at our supercomputer centers. So we've got, you know, these are a whole set of, these are some of the flows that are being run by uh, using these Globus automation services to support analysis of data from scientific instruments. And each of them involves steps that uh, may uh, engage computation, uh, computation perhaps uh, on, on a computer such as the uh, Polaris system at Argonne. Um, and uh, I think I've got some results here. Right, so you can see th this shows the sequences of events occurring in each of these uh, flows. 
the orange part is compute. So you see some computational tasks that perhaps uh, you know, run for hundreds of seconds, but others you know, maybe just for tens of seconds or subseconds. And in order to provide you know, rapid response to users, we need to be able to schedule these all efficiently on whatever computers we have access to. So in some cases, we might want to send those off to cloud computing systems, but many of these applications are really specialized and optimized for running on supercomputers. So we need new scheduling uh, mechanisms to support their efficient uh, execution. Okay, to sort of start to wrap up. So, um, you know, I think many of us have been involved in building service-oriented applications that might run locally or may run uh, on cloud resources. Um, increasingly, as I think our, our networks become faster and more reliable, uh, and simultaneously the amount of data that's being produced uh, in many, many different places grows uh, also exponentially, uh, we need to move towards a more converged environment in which much computing is performed locally, but many activities are also performed remotely. And we, as we decide what is performed where, uh, we need to be making trade-offs between you know, cost of performing things locally but remotely, latency versus bandwidth, uh, you know, the cost, the, 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 um, the speed at which we can perform computations on a, on a local computer versus a remote computer, et cetera. Um, and uh, we've, we've been finding that by using you know, cloud services, as, as I've described, to coordinate activities, we can achieve highly, highly, high degrees of reliability, um, regardless of where our application components are actually running. And that's you know, thanks to this, uh, you know, this infrastructure that we and others have been building out in which we deploy services that allow us to access data anywhere, compute anywhere, um, build applications that link computing and data access uh, in a reliable manner. Um, all this being done in a trusted fashion thanks to delegation protocols. Um, so we end up with uh, some technologies that allow us to do some very interesting things. Um, so one thing I thought I'd wrap up with. So, so this uh, technology that I've described means that you know I can I as a person can build applications that run across resources uh, uh, and and you know, data resources, compute resources, etc. At, at a global at a global scale. So I can do a, a amazing things that I could not previously uh, and and think w would be possible. Um, so what else could we do with this uh, fabric we've now got that links everything together? Well, so one, one thing we, I'm, I find quite interesting, and it's gonna sound, bear with me, it's gonna sound sort of uh, buzzword compliant, but if I can compute uh, anywhere and delegate to programs the right to compute on my behalf, then I can also combine uh, that with you know, some of these emerging large language model technologies like uh, AutoGPT and Langchain and so forth. And, you know, and, and have programs that, so this is a Langchain picture showing, you know, I'm, it's a little structure that's gonna try a few different ways of testing a hypothesis and come up and tell me a result. Well, as well as just accessing databases, uh, as people tend to do, we could also be running simulations on supercomputers. We could be running uh, experiments, physical experiments, um, here's a couple of, see if I can make this work. I don't know. Well, I can, look. So this is from our self-driving labs work. Um, real experiment on the left is a simulated experiment. It's the same experiment taking place. Uh, so let's say I can, I can define LLMs that, LLM-based systems that can say, uh, well, I've got a hypothesis. Um, I've got been delegated rights to do certain things, so I can fire up an experiment at, at uh, Argonne National Lab and perhaps run a simulation at the University of Virginia. Uh, you can well imagine that the pace of uh, progress and innovation could be accelerated if we could do such things. Okay. So, uh, 
maybe I'll wrap up at this point. Um, you know, I've used this word continuum. It was not a major theme, but we're now able to compute anywhere, uh, access data anywhere. What should we do next? And lots of fascinating research questions that arise um, that I hope we'll all be looking at. We can build new sorts of services that not only uh, are always available and provide useful services, but that perhaps can now be very uh, creative in how they solve the problems that we pose to them if they are able to use resources uh, on a global scale. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. are there any questions? Any questions. If, you, if you're in the audience, make the question short, sir, because I have to... Repeat them? To repeat it. Sorry. Oh. Yes. Uh, for Zeta scale, there's the issues of power, new types of computer quantum countries fire, different types of parallelism. How does EN participate in this? So, so this, this question asks if you really go to the uh, uh, ultimate limits of Zeta scale or uh, even below, you're going to have to look at uh, special features like quantum computing and others. How, how do you see that happening? Well, uh, so quantum computing is perhaps just another form of accelerator or specialized device that one would want to be able to integrate into your computing fabric. So I'm not, as soon as quantum computers become available, I'm sure we'll make good use of them. Um, I think, yeah, but power, power trade-offs uh, is, you know, we, as we decide where to compute uh, and what to compute where, we, we will be making trade-offs between cost, latency, and also, I would imagine, increasingly power consumption uh, as well. Yes? Some data using some services, but not being aware of the continuum. Okay, so the, the question was in the, at the in the vision of continuum computing, how much of that should be uh, should the programmer be aware of, and how much should be hidden from him or her so that it's a yeah. transparent interface? Oh, it's a great great question. Yes. So uh, what I, I use the word continuum aware, I think, in one of my slides, uh, and. And what does that what does that mean? Um, and so I'm not quite sure, but I, I think one thing it means is you express uh, your logic in a way that um, does not is not aware of where things compute, and then your this infrastructure is has the flexibility to put things where they where things matter. But I, I do think ultimately, because automated systems are not uh, are never as good as we'd like them to be, we want to allow people to express preferences for where things should one run and maybe that's a way of being continuum uh, aware yes Okay, so that question is about the um, need to have collaboration between computer or AI experts and domain scientists to make progress. And there are certainly um, many, many areas which are not quite as up to date as other areas and their use of modern, yeah. uh, modern high performance and AI technologies. Yeah, so that's, a, of course, a, a wonderful question, and we could talk about it at great length. Uh, you know, one thing I just, uh, not to trivialize it at all, but, you know, it used to be that science teams had people working with them that helped them get the internet working. But now that's just taken for granted. Um, I think with the work I've been talking about here, it, we're, we're making it possible to take for granted 
another set of infrastructure capabilities, moving data where you want, um, computing wherever you want. Uh, of course, the, what you're going to compute is still going to require, uh, you know, often consultation with an expert. I, I think it's much less the case than it used to be, uh, thanks to the availability of the internet, uh, GitHub repositories, and so forth. But it's always going to be the case if you're pushing uh, at the cutting edge of methods, you're going to want method experts advising you, I think. You have a question there? So uh, first, thank you for a uh, really inspiring presentation. Uh, I had one question because uh, you meant uh, a lot of what you presented depends on trust. And on one of your slides, you had 1,700 plus identity providers. Mm -hmm. So how do you establish trust between those 1,700 identity providers? How do you apply policies at global scale to them, uh, yeah. given the geopolitical situation we also have are in? Uh, and I guess you know a lot about that. Yeah. And finally, um, how, how does this scale uh, into the future? Uh, or are you, with Globus, creating a single point of failure in your security architecture by centralizing it? By what's the last word? By, by centralizing yeah. Uh, it. Yeah, so uh, we, you know, we like others who, who are, you know, we, the, the research community and the educational com community has set up this wonderful network of um, identity collaboration me mechanisms uh, you know but ultimately there are individual points where individuals have to say am I going to accept this identity from this person uh, or from this as vouched for by this identity provider um, and you know that's different entities will make different decisions um, so for some purposes purposes I may be happy to accept uh, an identity from this uh, provider and for other purposes not. So that is, you know, whether whether the the people the strength of the trust that people put in other people's identities um, is perhaps uh, a weakness of any approach of this of this sort. Uh, I mean, there are large examples of where people seem happy to do this on a very large scale. For example, Amazon. But you know that's with all sorts of limiting Amazon, not not Amazon Web Services, but Amazon.com. You know when the number of people who buy things online uh, with apparently very weak notions of trust underpinning those purchases. You know whether we can do something similar for research, I, it remains to be seen. I guess. Okay, I'll ask a question. So, um, in your vision, uh, I see it as somewhat hard to implement if you, you one of your examples use open fold now that's probably going to be running in parallel yep. with uh, mpi which is not so trivial to get to work everywhere and also needs lots of computers yep. plus the performance is lousy unless the data is right yep. next to the mm -hmm. gpus and things so how does a, a people outside argon national lab and other such facilities uh, invoke um, globus compute flows with large large subsistence as part of them. Right, so, uh, I mean, part of what we're doing is reducing the, the friction barriers associated with uh, the most obvious access constraints um, to using unique resources. So I, I can now access uh, a unique scientific instrument, a unique supercomputer. Uh, right, I, there's still, I still need some policy that will grant me that access. But I, I think what we can then do is increasingly make it possible for people to set up uh, the collaboration networks that will let a group of people get together and run a large uh, alpha fold training run, and then perhaps you know distribute the re re resulting um, structures, or to train a particular model on a particular community curated set of data and then distribute the shared model to many to many people. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask one last question? So, uh, Yen, thank you for your excellent talk. I, I have a quick question. You talked a lot about uh, in terms of the high performance computing, move the large amount of data. Uh, how about the other way around? Is it possible we move the program logic 
uh, as a kind of data to uh, the huge data uh, sets. And if yeah. possible or viable, uh, how possible it will be, or if there are any hurdles you think we have to pass from the research and development point of view. Thank right, you. So, the, I mean, the federated learning example I gave is is uh, is one of people moving logic, programming logic to the to the data, um, and uh, I think those sorts of applications are going to become increasingly increasingly common. Uh, in, in fact, um, although it is amazing how often uh, it is simpler just to move the data to where you, to where you want it to be. So I'm sure we'll be doing both, and and uh, it's historically been very hard to move computation for reasons of uh, code portability and and such like. We seem to be overcoming those problems. The trust issues involved in moving uh, computation to remote locations remain, but I think we're getting better at addressing those as well. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, so Ian, you had a very interesting slide right at the beginning where you looked at the development of foundation models that could be pushed to, you know, adapt for SARS-CoV. So given the computational capacity at national labs, could one thing to be to actually not move the data or the computation, but actually move around models? Mm -hmm. For example, if I look at TensorFlow and many of the other, yep. uh, you know, systems, they actually have pre-built models that can be shipped to edge resources. So how about trying to build models which are foundation models that can be then moved around the globe and people could then use them and adapt them in some way absolutely yeah no i think that's uh lots of people are trying to do that and i, I hope very much hope that uh, this will become a much more uh, common uh, use case for sharing scientific knowledge of course there are lots of you know challenges you know who's what are the who's going to give you your training data under what conditions will are you will you be allowed to use it Will people know whether or not they can trust the results of those models? But but it's uh, going to become more common, I think. And you know, I, I gave the the Slack uh, analysis example. There, we're training a model that we're deploying at at a at a beamline at an instrument. Um, there are some of my colleagues are also looking at training foundation models. You know, that have are not specific to a single application, but can process a wide variety of different uh, sorts of tomographic data sets in this case. So that sounds very promising. Yeah, I think we've uh, reached the, the right time to stop. I'd like to thank Ian for his wonderful talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.